Thank you, Sid. We're going to have a little bit of a QA, and uh, I've got a few questions, but I will encourage everyone from the audience to just raise their hand whenever they want to ask a question. I have a first question. Why did you write this book? What exactly did you see? I know you're a business leader <laughs> that you thought of writing this book. I don't know, craziness? <laughs> um, uh, I think if you look at uh, my, my history in terms of what I've done, as you said, I've done I've been a student of philosophy at times, I've been doing business for quite a, quite a while, and in most of the businesses that I've done, this whole idea of using data and analytics somehow or another to gain advantage was built into it. I have worked with a lot of startups companies, I've, uh, uh, I've worked in turnarounds, and in the past four or five years, I've uh, being at KPMG, I've done a lot more work with Fortune 50, Fortune 100, you know, top big company CEOs and chief strategies. And what I found was that uh, it's not for the lack of desire. It's, uh, but there's this gap, <laughs> there's this thing that, you know, big companies are really addicted to certain things that they've been addicted to, the way they budget, the way they do things. And, and they're trying to take this world which has a different set of rules. It's like they're playing basketball, they're expecting the world to play basketball, but the rules are different. This is football. Uh, this requires a lot of changes. This requires breaking barriers, breaking the way you're doing things and getting rid of some of those things. Yes, they try to bring in innovation centers, but they impose their own set of things on the innovation center. Again, it's not for lack of interest. The same thing happens on the other side, where I see the early stage companies kind of flip back always to uh, this notion, well, we didn't have enough money, uh, or, uh, or kind of falling into this trap always of chasing things. Um, so there's, the disease kind of is, is, is on both sides. It has different flavors. Uh, so that addiction, if you would, uh, that kind of intrigued me. Uh, and I started thinking and, and kind of it, it came to this, to me it came to this, came to this conclusion that we've got a, it's a fundamental change in the way we look at things and the way we want to solve the problem. It's how we identify the problem to begin with. So that kind of uh, intrigued me uh, and, and the process kind of evolved as the book evolved, and we all evolve in, in getting to, uh, to what you have here. So I have actually uh, read the book, enjoyed it, um, shared it with many friends as a gift. And uh, surprisingly, I took a month to read this book <laughs> because every chapter I read, I went into a thought process. And So I've got a few questions lined up. One of the questions is first I'm going to ask you from a personal life perspective and then from a, some business perspective. You know, like, I'm an entrepreneur. I've um, worked hard, I built a company, and I feel like now I'm ready to uh, relax a little bit, you know? Go to Laguna more often. Uh, maybe enjoy some of the finer aspects as, of life. But every time I do that, um, I feel like my business calls me back, saying there's another crisis. So are you saying that I will never reach a point where I can be comfortable and chill and have a lifestyle business? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, there's, there's this thing about the way we look at life and business, and, and we see it as two completely separate entities. What, what I've seen, like there's sections in the book that, you know, I talk about the millennials and how they look at life and stuff like that. But uh, we don't, we, we, we look at work as something separate from our enjoyment and day-to-day -day thing. So I have to do this so I can make money or have the pleasures of doing this. And that separation, if you look at the millennials, that separation is gone. When they look at work, they look at, hey, this is what I do. This is part of my life. This is my life. So until you're separating this, obviously one becomes a chore and one becomes pleasure. Now, 
if you're evolving in your business, you should be evolving personally. So it's, it's hand to hand. You can't say it is one or the other. No, you may choose that you'd like to evolve in a certain direction and not work. That's fine, that's your choice. But you can't have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> Something is gonna give, unless you, both of them are within your domain of change and evolution. Does that make sense? Well, which means every time I plan a two week vacation, I have to cancel it. <laughs> Max, I no. can do is a week's vacation. What, is, what does that mean? How do I balance this thing? Well, see, you know, I get this question actually from, I, I got it from a uh, you know, head of an automotive industry, big, big week. He says, well, Sid, you talk about this dynamically planning and always changing. We can't do that. Well, the idea isn't when I say change all the time, that doesn't mean that every two minutes you have a new strategy for the company. That is ridiculous. You can't do that. It's if you go from a year and a half to nine months, maybe to six months, you just got 67% better agility. You have an edge over the other guy who didn't do that. So dynamic is a very relevant thing. It depends on your business, it depends on who you are, it depends how much you want to achieve. In a startup, dynamic may be every quarter because you are testing the value proposition and, you know, and, and then that may, that may get longer over time. So it's not about not taking vacations. It's not about, it's not about not detaching while you're on vacation. But while you're doing what you're doing, don't get comfortable in what you've done forever. Challenge the assumptions. Be open to evolve, take the risk. If you don't take the risk, the risk of demise is higher. So let me convert that to a business question. You know, um, Microsoft, was a big revolution company, right? They came up with something extremely new, a new operating system, Microsoft Office, and so many things. <clears throat> and for a while, it looks like they were taking over the whole world. And then for a while, they looked like they were leading, going nowhere. And now they look like they're just back and humming and everything's right. And I know you've done a lot of analysis for this book. Can you share what is your take on, uh, on an organization like that? What do you think? They did right and wrong. And um, <clears throat> so I, I talk about this concept of emergence, saying that every organization is essentially a living entity. Uh, you know, we talk about sales and this and that and that. And that. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of connected. They're, 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 they're one entity. Uh, so each entity evolves and has a path that's different. So. Uh, let's take uh, Apple and Microsoft. They both started with one vision, to build a personal computer. That was what they tried to do. But look at where Apple has gone and look at where Microsoft has gone. So they've gone, uh, neither one of them, you could say it's wrong approach. But if you look at <clears throat> the period of Apple where jobs left, uh, it was struggling. They were going broke. Uh, they didn't have any I new ideas, no new innovation, and then it came back. And then we have this iPhones and iTunes and new business models of charging for, you know, uh, for subscribing or buying digital music and, and all that. And Microsoft, that was when Bill Gates, the founder, left, essentially. And we had one of the founders that was still there. But the style of management was big company. It was, we are it, we are the behemoth. And those addictions, those uh, parameters of running the company was basically entangling them. They tried a lot of stuff. They bought, a no they bought Nokia, they bought, you know, they did a lot of stuff. For example, they started a, a game company. They, they started Xbox, wonderful games. I was an addict, you know, addicted to it. Uh, but then they didn't evolve to make it open to be shared. They said, our plan, my, my domain, my platform. Now, they realized 10 years later that they've made a mistake. So the key about uh, uh, 
the evolution is two things. One is uh, the coach, and two is the players. Um, the the leader uh, now for Microsoft uh, has broken a lot of the rules, has put a lot of the old stuff aside, has trimmed the organization, cut the barriers a lot, uh, and that has unleashed uh, a lot of innovation. Uh, and and that's I think what uh, what has caused uh, you know the real change. Now uh, there are some fluff in there. To be honest with you, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Cloud uh, is really not there yet. You know, like Amazon has a great deal of edge over them. Uh, the uh, the the surface and the tablet is doing pretty good. The gaming stuff they're trying to evolve. So there are pockets of things that are still fall in that hoopla category, uh, but they are evolving in the right direction. Now the question is for Apple. Uh, you know what's going to happen uh, since uh, Samsung has taken so much of the market share. And they really don't have that innovation engine. They're trying to get into auto, you know, self-driving cars as, uh, and, and those things. But that's a that's an unwritten story. The the judge, you know, the the, the jury is out on that. Okay, I have one more question, and then I'll uh, open it up to the audience. So, you just mentioned that okay, Microsoft did a you know course correction. They heard what people had to say. They opened up their uh, you know ecosystem. You know, uh, and I know you're a big data analytics guy. So, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Touchy subject. <laughs> Touchy subject, but hey, we don't have to be politically correct every time. But Hillary Clinton had a huge data analytics machine. She had a team, an army, and millions behind analyzing data, what people are saying, what people are thinking, doing everything, you know, right based on what she's reading on her data analytics pulse. But then um, she lost it all. So, what what is your? And I know, and I mean, having known you uh, with with Wise Window, I know you predicted almost a lot of elections at the city level, council level, state level, Congress. So, what is your take? What happened? I mean, she listened to all the data analytics and everything. Um, um, so, and and that's uh, that's kind of part of this idea of the hoopla and the truth. It, it yes. kind of falls under that. Um, the fact that I have some Hadoop machines and I have some data scientists in the room does not necessarily guarantee a win. That's where I say you have to go from you know, uh, competing on analytics, which was a great thing when Obama was running. They, it was new. They looked at it from the right perspective. Four years later or eight years later, the Hillary machine was trying to solve the problem using the exactly same approach. So, uh, I mean, as an, as an observer, if there are 20,000 people in every city that Trump goes, and I ignore that, there is something there. Why, why, why is 20,000 people going there? Uh, the fact that when they did the, um, uh, the polling, uh, and this was not, this is not, you know, I wasn't saying that, this was pretty well known, yeah. that, uh, you know, not everybody is uh, is actually acknowledging that they're going to vote for Trump because of the negativity of, hey, you must be a bigot, you must be a this, you must be a that. So they would give false answers. Now, if if you would look at that, for example, in the uh, in the Chinese culture, we I had a company once uh, that we had an office there and we did business there. And usually here, you know, market research, you go ask people, do you like this, and how do you like this, and can I make it better? And Well, you ask the Chinese clients of ours, and it was 100% they love what we did. Well, it wasn't true. They just didn't want to hurt our feeling that that wasn't good. So, so the idea is that, I, I call it uh, shifting your frame of reference. And... This is, what, this is what it means. I wish I had a Starbucks coffee. My students usually are fed up with my, my example of Starbucks coffee. Um, 
if you are a Starbucks fan, you know that on one side you have the, the logo. If you just look at this from one side, you just know that that cup came from Starbucks. You turn that a little bit, and you would see Rajat's name. And that tells you that this is a Starbucks coffee that came from Rajat. What did you do? You just changed your frame of reference. And then if you turn it again, you will see that it is a latte. So by turning around the data, by looking at it from different perspectives, you will be able to gain significantly additional insight than by looking at it the way that you've done it four years ago. The problem is that we hire data scientists and we get these processes and pictures and BI things and all of that sort of built. And it's a long process to build this. So we always look at the data from the exact same perspective. And if you look at the data from the exact same perspective, most likely you get the same answer. So I think uh, the, the election was an anomaly or a learning process. It wasn't the data. It was how you read the data. It was the people that were reading the data. And at times, we torture data to admit to whatever we want them to. So um, I hope it's a learning experience. And you know, some others have written you know, uh, articles around it, around you know, uh, you know, Tom Davenport and others that, hey, don't blame the data. It's, it's us. We're reading it. And if you choose to read it because it's the most comfortable for us, then shame on us. So it's not the data, it's how you read it. Correct. OK, questions, anyone? Hi, Sid. Hello. Great uh, talk on the Caterpillar's Edge. Uh, question. Uh, you know, a lot of times I think about uh, with clients myself, uh, you know, you have sort of the theory, the mantra. It's kind of like in the stock market. You want to be a successful investor, buy low, sell high. Yeah, sounds great. But how do you execute on that sort of plan? And so what are your thoughts in terms of a lot of the, the mantras, the ideas, the theory, in getting people, whether it's personal or a corporation, to actually execute on it, because a lot of times the devil's in the details and the execution. I'd be curious what your thoughts yeah. on that. So uh, obviously in any kind of, uh, in any kind of uh, execution mode, if you would, and I, I kind of want us to think through this process of uh, there is no, here's planning, it's done, now we're executing, because then it's like, oh, we're done, comfortable, let's go do this. This is a continuous process. But when you get to the, uh, to the notion of how do I execute a plan? How do I get what I want done? Assuming that you're prepared to change along the way, because that's the thing. The key elements are, are people, both leadership and, and people. You know, we blame the, uh, the machinery, we blame the technology, we blame other things because uh, because it's comfortable to blame those things. Um, and that's where I talk about appreciating reality. OK, this is my reality. Let's match up what I want to accomplish, and then how I build up my capabilities to do that. Now, thinking about the people, obviously, leadership is, is critical. Um, leadership that feels that failure is not a crime uh, is important. Uh, but. I talk about this notion of uh, uh, creative crisis and, and, and changing the rhythm of the organization. Every organization, if you go to IBM, it has a rhythm. It works. People know how they work. Uh, you know, you go from this company uh, to that company, and you begin working at your desk or your office, and your coworkers, and they work in a certain way. They have certain urgencies. They have certain ways of communicating. That's the rhythm. That, that's the rhythm. Just like you and I have a rhythm at, at work and at home. We do things in certain ways. To break somebody's rhythm, which is, here's, here's how I do things. If I ask people to change, I'm not asking them to change once. I'm asking them to change all the time. 
somehow they have to change their rhythm. And people don't like to change. This is, I'm comfortable with my rhythm. I'm good. We change our rhythm basically based of, on, on two reasons. And two reasons only, as far as I know. I mean, you could extend this to uh, infinitum and pontification, but it's basically the first thing, it's got to be severe. The situation now, I have to feel that if I do not change my rhythm, it's not to my advantage. If I have a heart attack, I guarantee you I'm going to quit smoking. <laughs> but until then, I sneak one or another, you know, every once in a while. It's fun. It's fun. Like so, <laughs> so until I have a severity of the problem, I won't change my rhythm. The second thing is, if I want to change to something, I've got to trust that that something is better than what I had. I'm not going to change to something that's worse than what I had. And that's in companies, it's the leadership. I have to trust that the leadership is taking me in the right direction. And I suggest that data and analytics can support both of those cases. So I can prove to people, not once, not, not flipping one report, say, hey, you see, you gotta change your rhythm. No, let them in the process of understanding what direction we're going at. And if we're going down this hill and if competition is eating us alive, They'll know. They'll change their rhythm because of self-preservation. But then to change to a direction that is different, then you have to show them the direction that we're going is the right direction to go, which is the trust that gets built again with data. Make sense? That's a question. Mr. On Mayor, how are you, sir? Very good. Question on change. When uh, you and I have served on boards where we have <laughs> change is constant. Can we delete that portion? <laughs> <laughs> so you have a, a strategy du jour every board meeting. It changes. Now, one could argue, well, that's evolution. They're doing constant change. That's every quarter. It's yeah. a change. Yeah. And yet, how do you make sure you don't fall into the trap of using change as an avoidance of accountability and lack of execution? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, e excellent, excellent question. It's the opposite of we're too, you know, we're, we, how can we be dynamic? It's the early stage mostly have this, uh, this disease of, of trying the, the, you know, the, the strategy du jour, you know, how do we go from here to there? And they call it evolution. Um, I think the best sentence that used was by uh, Austin Butner. Austin Butner. Uh, he was one of the founders of uh, uh, Evercore, one of the largest uh, uh, investment bankers in, in the country. Um, he was the CEO of LA Times and stuff. Uh, and he said, said, we have to differentiate between being dynamic and being erratic. That is being erratic. So. The fact that we have to change doesn't necessarily mean that we have to change every 10 minutes. Now, in the life of a company, every quarter, I, I remember, would go there every month, and there was a series of slides, and you know, we have had a couple of conversations, and we want to move here. Well, did we do this? Well, no. Well, you, you can't, you know, you gotta let the marinara sauce cook. <laughs> you, you can't change it midstream. So uh, that is a danger. That, uh, that usually folks that have not run companies face. Or it's a danger that is at times unfortunately imposed by the VCs. <laughs> that they want to see traction, <laughs> they don't let things stabilize, and they'll say, well, we have to do something different. So in, the, in order to not to come to a board meeting and say, I have failed, they come to a meeting and say, I have succeeded with finding a new thing. That, that's again this notion of uh, penalizing the failure and people begin to kind of uh, erratic behaviors as a result of that. So I have a question on, um, you know, I think about Walmart. In the 90s, it looked like everything they were doing was right. They were beating Kmart had its game, they were baiting Sears at its game, they had a global supply chain, they were working hard, they were going to Nicaragua, Vietnam, Bangladesh, everywhere, building these automated supply chains to get the best price for the customer. 
day one, there was a Walmart in every town and blah, blah, blah. And Amazon was something that just was happening in the late 90s and, you know, now it looks like everything that Walmart did in the middle seems to be wrong and everything that Amazon seems to be doing is right. So what exactly do you think Walmart didn't read on the data? Or were they just comfortable with their success? I mean, they were very aggressive. They went worldwide, built an amazing supply chain. What did they do wrong? So let's, let's first acknowledge that 100 million customers a day is nothing to sneeze at. That, that is, so growing at that level and then continuing to grow is a little bit of a challenge. Um, on the online side, they do about $10 billion. That's nothing to sneeze at either. That's a lot of products. So could have they done better if Amazon is doing 70 some billion, billion and they're doing 10? Absolutely. But when you look at it, they have some infrastructure and again, going back to the addiction, some processes that they have bought into, assuming that the world will operate like this for the future. So uh, I'll give you one example. The way that the warehouse is designed for, for Walmart is a conventional way. Here is, we've got this place, it's got a location number on it, and we have teddy bears in there. And we have this place, which is on the other side of the warehouse, and we keep CDs and whatever, and we have a system that says we have 72 teddy bears and 64 CDs, and, and, and then we push the product to the stores where they get on weekly basis, they'll say, send me 20 teddy bears, 17 of these, and 17 CDs. They package them up and ship them to store, and then the store sells them. Now, the way an Amazon transaction is done is not at a store level, and it's not 20 teddy bears. It's you come in, you push the thing, and you want a teddy bear. He wants the, he wants the computer. He wants the, and it's coming from all sorts of different directions in a random kind of a way. It's not going to a store that could be... So the way that they've designed the warehouse at Amazon is in one bucket, as opposed to one thing, there are 20 different things. It's based on the space that they have. They have you know, four feet by four feet, they could have uh, CDs, they could have uh, teddy bears, they could have all of them in one place. And they've designed their technology to support that. What that does, it takes a lot of, more, uh, a, a lot of fat out of the process. So now they can compete on price. Now they can deliver faster. So, so let me ask the question, where do you think or when do you think Walmart read the data wrong, that they continued on this path till they felt like, hey, we are um, losing the whole game. I actually had a conversation, in, and, and in the book I talked to the uh, former C, uh, CIO of, of Walmart.com. Here's what their assumption is, is every time the, somebody buys something online, if they have to come to the store, I'm gonna sell them four times the amount of what they bought. So if they buy $1, they buy four dollars, three other dollars, three more dollars, buying other stuff because they're in the store. Okay? Spontaneity, they walked in the store, so they want to. So they say, well, our business is really at the store. Our concentration is at the store. The site is just the way to get people to the store. So it's an, it's an afterthought. So that changes the focus of how you run your business. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example again on, on Walmart.com. Walmart.com has a CEO, has a CIO, has an entire team. They do all the stuff in terms of the transactions and blah, 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 blah. But they cannot control their merchandising. Walmart store does the control. Okay, so if I can't control my merchandising, what online store cannot control what they put on? doesn't make any sense, but it's economical. It's very, very efficient for Walmart because they, they do the purchasing uh, in, a, in a very effective way. So again, I wanna make sure that you know, there is, it's not that they've failed. <laughs> they've adopted a strategy that is centered around their stores and they have phenomenal supply chain stuff. So just to follow on on that, and then I'll ask a question from the audience. 
Amazon seems to be evolving every day. Every day we think that they've reached, now they've taken over the retail business and they come up with a whole new plan. We think they've done that, they want to have their own airline. What exactly are they doing? What's their mindset that we can learn from to say, okay, if I was to read data like this or think like this, I could be a mini Amazon evolving all the time. So uh, I talk about, again, the millennials. And if you look at the, the research, it says that 80-some percent, I forget the exact numbers, uh, believe that they deserve more. Again, 80-some percent believe that they can get more. It's not just, I deserve something. It's I can actually go get it. That's a mindset. <laughs> that is Jeff Bezos' mindset, that we deserve to be doing other things and to be evolving, and then mobilizing the innovation machine together. So that's one, the desire. The second is the fear of failure. They move in a direction and, uh, and then push as much as they can and, and they adjust course as much as they can. And uh, uh, the other thing is they're very real about, actually I have a story in the book around you know, some uh, discussion I had with, uh, with a retail, uh, CEO of a retail company uh, about what Amazon was doing. And the, uh, and the retail guy, this is a pretty big sizable company, he's not there anymore. Uh, but uh, he was saying, these guys don't understand retail. Retail is about people touching things and feeling things, and it's tight margins. It's, uh, they don't know about warehousing and inventory control. Well, they figured it out. But along the way, they did some other things. Like, they saw that they have all these assets in their computers. And they figured out, hey, I got all these assets. What do I do with these assets? And that gave birth to this whole idea of the Amazon cloud, which is now a significant piece of their business. It's a very, very profitable business. They are the king of that. They are pretty damn good. Everybody else is a follower. So the ability to use what your capabilities are, the ability not to be fearful of what you can accomplish, uh, and uh, and the ability to have this desire to want more, and you know, I call it aspire more, you have gotta aspire more, uh, is, is the combination that kind of creates that kind of a mindset. And obviously that trickles down to the, to the company. I mean, there's lots of studies about how they operate and how the people behave and how the employees are. Some don't like it, they think that they work until midnight or one or two o'clock in the morning, most of them love doing what they're doing. And they get paid really well. So, Sid, you've been talking a lot about uh, decision making by data and how you read the data. Uh, and especially among, let's say, uh, entrepreneurial companies and young entrepreneurs, where does instinct play a part? Where does instinct come? Uh, instinct and experience are based on data. So I have this instinct, uh, I've been doing this business for a long time, and I say, I think this is gonna work. So basically I'm basing it based on my historical information. Now, the combination of this idea of uh, changing your frame of reference and looking at different data sources, it would validate, enhance your instinct. So you see an opportunity. You think that's a good thing. As opposed to picking the data pieces that validates that you're right as an entrepreneur. You have to be honest and actually pick things that disvalidate what you're thinking. And if you can disprove those points, then you have proved your instinct. So that's one. Try to disprove yourself if you have an instinct. The second thing is, failing is okay as long as you learn from it. As long as you don't 
you know, you, you don't bet the bank and the whole family and your environment on it. If you have a way to test the value, pro like, you know, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, they can test some value propositions on Facebook really quickly. But they go out and they're trying to raise money, millions of dollars to build infrastructure and build to scale. Well, we're going to have a million people. What's going to happen if they all come? Well, we'll deal with that if they all come. You're going to have so many people invest in you and back you up if, the, if a million people come. You wouldn't know how, it, how you got the money. Let's test the value proposition. Let's make sure it works. You have an instinct? Test it out. Validate and look at and see how you can disprove this theory. And if you can't disprove it, you're probably looking at the right set of, set of data. Um, instinct goes against data. The human instinct. The human instinct never. See, this is the fundamental. I, I think this is a fallacy that we think that our instinct is just appears like from Mars. You get that instinct because you have this life experience. What is experience? Is data. It's not necessarily data from a machine that you look at the chart. What you have, what you know, is data. It's information, it's intelligence. So it is based on data, but it's not based on a chart. You may have talked to six or seven people to validate your point, and they don't have any data to give you. So what you're doing is you have an instinct, and you validate that with other people's experience. You're gaining data from them. This notion, again, this, this, this idea of the hoopla is that we think that uh, data analytics came out yesterday. You know, all, all these big data, blah, 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 was born yesterday. Nonsense. You know, a hundred years ago, somebody sitting in a store in Iran or in India or in Wisconsin uh, with a shoe store, watching people go by, would say, oh, people are looking at the red shoe more than the blue shoe. They're buying this one more than that one. Okay, so he goes out and buy more red shoes and puts it in the... <laughs> oh, this is a street, now they, a school opened up. So let's have something that has a younger flavor to it. We were, they were using data. <laughs> We've always used data to, to analyze things. Different kinds. And by the way, data has always been big. This notion of big data, it's always been big. I remember 30 years ago, I had this uh, you know, spreadsheet. I would hand write all this stuff, and then I would go to the seventh you know, day or the eighth day, and 72 pages long, and then things didn't add up. Oops. That data was big for me. And somebody came up with a DBase 2, and then boom, it was solved. And then we thought, oh, that's neat. Let's see if we could do that with our supply chain and other companies. And then we needed a relational database. And oracles of the world and others came up with alternatives to do that. We had unstructured data. We solved that problem. We have Internet of Things. We're going to solve that problem. At every point, it has been comprehension of data that's more important. It is what you get out of it that's important, and how fast you get it. Can you do that faster than the competitor? Can you learn something new? So I, I have an add-on question to that, and let me give you a real life, I mean, a real example, a business example. So I am the CEO of Toyota, I've got all the data, I'm analyzing, I'm reviewing my markets, I see people now want SUVs, then they want now small cars, and millennials want blah, 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 and the Europeans want this. And all of a sudden comes this thing called Tesla. They've taken over the entire luxury segment. It doesn't, it's not even a car by, from a Toyota's perspective, because it's got none of the components. It's just got a battery and place to sit, and it moves. The only thing that we have in common is that it works on the road. How could I have not lost my luxury segment market if I was Mercedes or BMW to Tesla? What, could, what did I misread? So, <laughs> uh, I've, worked, uh, I've worked with, uh, I would say, almost all of big car companies. <laughs> Um, Japanese, U.S., 
Koreans. Um, and they, they always had this assumption, and the assumption was building a car is a complicated thing to yes. do. You don't understand how complicated it is. It takes seven years to design it. It has to be a platform, and then you have to design it, and then every piece has to work, and guess what? There are so many regulations that nobody can crack. So that mindset is the addiction that nobody can come in. Nobody can compete with me, and therefore I'm safe. So first of all, this, this notion that I'm safe is unsafe. Uh, is unsafe. <laughs> You're not safe. Whatever you do. Uh, the second thing is, let's look at what Tesla has done. This is amazing to me. If you, you, if you have a Tesla, I think your wife has a Tesla, right? Yes. yes this is a wealthy people. This is. Uh, I have a Toyota. <laughs> if you have a Tesla and you park it in, uh, at, at home and you sleep and you get up the next morning, that Tesla is a better car than it was yesterday. Because they uploaded information on it. It's a better car than you had yesterday. So let's fast forward. Three years from now, every night your car has been upgrading. You bought a car today. Three years from now, your car is a much better car than what you purchased. So what happened to the used car market? The assumption is that I buy a car, and three years from now, I want another Tesla because it's a better car. I want another Mercedes because it has the gizmos and the this and the that and all the new stuff in it. Because the old one didn't have the stuff in it. Bluetooth. So that is a fundamentally different approach. That's a fundamentally different approach to, have, to, to building a car. Now, that is innovation and a different kind of thinking than what the old guys have been thinking. Now, they're trying to kind of struggle and figure it out. But you know what they do? I, I had one occasion that I asked somebody, pretty Detroit company, and they have organized all the folks to come on a tour to Silicon Valley, assuming that if they go and visit six different VCs and five different startups, all of a sudden they're going to be geniuses and they're going to change everything. It's, it's this notion that, hey, we could change this with ignoring the fundamentals of the problems that they've got. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? How's it going? <laughs> uh, I'm one third through the book, and I love the wisdom of the uncle in the stationary school. Uh, story. The one eyed uncle. Uh, yeah, the uncle. Yeah, yeah. wonderful guy. So I have one question about big data. I took a class last week. How do you see the big data affecting business strategy? And at what stage of your business model do you effectively use big data? Uh, good question. I think it goes back to the notion of definition of what big data is. So if you, uh, if you listen to SAP, Hannah's pitch, or if you listen to Hadoop's pitch, or if you listen to IBM Watson pitch, they're slightly different. <laughs> and they each define big data as something different. Uh, if, uh, if you're in the unstructured data business, the big data is all unstructured. Now, which one is big, bigger, all the unstructured data, or every car and your uh, your air conditioner at every home and the refrigerator in every home and uh, sprinklers in every home through Internet of Things talking together. That's, that's much bigger. So if I'm a small company and I don't have all the capabilities, really everything is big to me. <laughs> so the question is, when I talk about big data, it's about more data. It's, can I step 10% more, gain 10% more intelligence, then I'll be doing 10% better against my competitor. Because I'm competing with you. We have two companies, they're both small. If you're able to large, enlarge your circle by 10% and get more data, more intelligence, more insight, 
move faster, be more competitive, you're beating me. You don't need to beat IBM. You just need to beat me. We'll get there eventually. <laughs> but you just need to beat your own competitors within your own areas. And if you have more insight, you can make better decisions. You can validate your instincts. Or disprove them and not fail and waste your money. Okay, I think we have time. And then time the last one question one. for the night, and then we'll. <clears throat> Without any doubt, Apple and their job was one of the most innovative companies in the world. A lot of it seems to be because Steve Jobs listened to his customers, you know. And I understand anybody sending him an email, you know, he would answer it. You know. Instead of all these legacy companies who have products and give people money, you know, to answer surveys, and then I don't know what kind of data they get out of those surveys. So, yeah, Steve Jobs is well known for saying that uh, it's not the customer's job to know what they need. It's my job. Um, but the fact of the matter is he was uh, reading the tea leaves in terms of uh, 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 the needs of the people, which is if I like personal computers and engaging with this, I haven't imagined this other thing, which is an iPhone. I can't imagine it. But... The basic thing is this, using a computer for personal purposes. So he built on that foundation, and the, and the fact was proven with personal computers, that I like to engage with my computer. So he wasn't completely winging it, in, you know, but he, you know, no doubt he was an innovator. Now, on a different side of this, you could argue that Samsung has now more market share and, and phones in smartphones than Apple does. And Samsung is pretty well known for learning from the unstructured data, particularly from Twitter and Facebook and others, and adding the features and characteristics that they added to their phones based on the analysis of the data. That's a fact. They did that. They did that before any other company. Uh, today, Tesla, going back to Tesla, there was an article recently in Inc. Magazine, I think, uh, that uh, Elon Musk checks his Twitter and people that respond, and he had responded known within six minutes. He says, you're right, that's a problem. We're going to fix it. And within three days, that bug, that issue, that enhancement was uploaded to your car. So the question of listening to the customer versus not listening to the customer is an old uh, you know, argument uh, that says, if you are having a fundamental understanding of what people need, you can then innovate against that need. We're not expecting people to innovate. We're expecting the innovators to understand what the need is. So asking people, do you like it green or yellow? Actually, you never ask them if they liked it purple. Maybe they like it purple. But looking at the trends and saying, hey, people are wearing purple, you can, you can guess that they like purple. So you, know, you could call that instinct. You can call it genius. You could call it, hey, I'm looking at all the different data points and coming together to come to a conclusion. Okay. Well, thank you, Sid. Thank you. Oh, thank you for hosting this. Again, thank you for coming. And